Gardening is for the most part an outdoor activity. And when we're outside, we need to be thinking about what the sun is doing to our skin. So joining us today is Kenda Baker. Hi. Hi, Kenda. Hi, Steve. Kenda is a physician's assistant at the OSU Wellness Center. And Kenda, why do we need to be worried about what the sun is doing to our skin? There are over a million new cases of skin cancer per year. That's pretty significant. And for most of us that enjoy being out in the sun, um, we can do that um, if we follow a couple of safety precautions. Okay, so when we're outside gardening or any other activity outside, how can we protect our skin? We'll start kind of at the top and work our way down. Um, hats are obviously uh, good protection, but they also need to be a certain type of hat. Okay. Um, closely woven is better than loosely woven, of course, because you're going to let UVA and UV rays um, through. But it needs to be a broad brim, something that's going to protect the ears and the side of the face. Ball caps don't do that, so they're not a good choice. We see a lot of skin cancers on the top of men's ears, also on the kind of the temporal area um, on the sides of the face. So we need to keep those areas protected. I know ball caps are popular, but they're not all that effective against uh, the sun. Okay. Um, next we have sunglasses. They just need to be uh, approved for UVA and UVB coverage. They don't need to be simply cosmetic looking, um, but that they should be labeled. Okay. Um, sunscreen, we'll talk about a little bit more in depth, uh, but sunblock on the lips, that's something that people forget about. Your lips are very sensitive skin, the, the skin is very thin, very common area for squamous cell carcinoma, so we need to protect those areas. Most of the lip balms will be uh, labeled with an SPF or sun protection factor. Okay, so we, we have a number of products here and uh, 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 can you tell, tell me just a little bit about uh, some of these different products and sure. how they work? Sunscreens work one of two ways. They will either reflect the sun physically, like with your zinc oxides that provide more of a, a opaque physical barrier from the sun, or they'll absorb the rays chemically, like with your oxybenzones or your Parcel 1789s. And those are the three most common sunscreens we see. Um, blocks are better than screens. You can think of it as a screen, like on your door would be this way. Okay. A block's actually going to be a little bit more opaque, so you okay. want to look for the sun block. The SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor. And that is just that, just a factor. It's not the same for you, it's not the same for me. I'm very fair skinned, I burn within about 15 minutes. So I take the 15 minutes that I would burn in and take it times the SPF of 15. And that's about how long I can stay out before I need to reapply. Okay. People that are olive skin tone, that don't uh, burn as easily as I would, um, can leave it on longer before they have to reapply. Another thing to think about is water resistant versus waterproof. Okay. And contrary to popular belief, waterproof is not waterproof. Water resistance will give you about 40 minutes of either water activity or sweating before you need to reapply. Waterproof will give you about 80 minutes before you need to reapply. Okay, so if we're, 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 if we're out in the garden and uh, we're, we're really working hard and we're sweating and uh, the, the sweat's just running off our face and off our nose, so we, we, we've got about 40 minutes Got about 40 minutes if it's water resistant. Okay. If it's waterproof, you've got about 80. So okay. you've got a little bit more leeway. So a couple of words to look for that'll actually get you more for your money. Okay. Um, there are a lot of complaints against sunscreen. A lot of men did not grow up with it, and it's hard to get into the habit of using sunscreen. My husband thinks it feels goopy or the, the whole outdoor sticks to him. Um, golfers and athletes don't like it. They're around the dirt, it gets they stuck to him. They don't like to use it in the first place and certainly don't want to reapply. They've come a long way with sunscreens, and there's a lot of different versions to choose from. They make some spray gels and some spray solutions, and they also make some dry lotions that go on very quickly. They dry. Uh, within a few minutes, not long at all, but they don't leave a residue, so things don't stick to you and they're very comfortable to use. The sprays are great for reapplying. I take it to the swimming pool. It's easy just to spray it on and get a good coat on in just a few seconds and the kids don't seem to mind. So they've come a long way. They've okay. also come a long, long way with the cosmetic part of it. This is an oil-free sunscreen that's in a moisturizer. So it's great for women to use on a daily basis. Um, a lot of our makeup does have an SPF in the foundation, but it's usually no more than eight. And that's really not enough if you're going to be out there any more than just getting in and out of your car. So you really need to add a little bit more to that. Okay. The SPF is additive in the sense that if you have an 8 in your foundation and you add a 15, you know, you've multiplied your, your length and your strength, okay. but you still need to reapply. So if uh, uh, the, the lotion or the makeup has, has the 8, you can just add that to your, mm -hmm. your sunscreen. It's going to give you a little bit higher strength, especially if it's a different type of sunscreen. It'll also give you a little bit longer, uh, longer life of your sunscreen. Okay, I have a question for you. If, it, if it's real cloudy outside, uh, 
Do we need to put on sunscreen? Probably more so than ever because one, you don't realize how much sun you're getting and the UVA and UVB rays are uh, independent of the sun or the, excuse me, of the cloud coverage that we have. So a lot of people get burned their worst on actually cloudy days. They just don't realize how much sun they've had. Okay. So it's important more than ever to use your sunscreen on those days. All right, so what if we're out gardening and we want to get a tan? What, uh, what do you recommend? I have a lot of people that say, can you tan through a sunscreen? Well, yes you can, but that, the whole idea behind the sunscreen is that you don't get a tan. A tan is uh, your body's way of saying that I've received sun damage. Uh, melanocytes are what are responsible for the brown pigment in our skin. We obviously have varying degrees in different people, but the sun's rays will actually cause those melanocytes to send more to the surface to protect the skin from further damage. So the more tan you have, it just means that you've had too more much damage. sun. Exactly. Um, so what I recommend is you do it the safe way, get your tan out of a bottle, and then use your sunscreen when you're out there, and you use a high SPF and use a block. Okay. Um, this is a line called Fake Bake. We carry this at the Serotene Wellness Center, and it's free to anybody that wants to use it. I mean, it's free to buy, excuse me. Um, this is one that's more longer lasting. It'll last one to two weeks. You put it on with an overnight application, and it's just very convenient because it stays on long periods of time. This is more your quick, I forgot to do anything last night and I'd like to have a tan to wear those shorts today. Um, this will only last about three or four days, so it's more of a, a last minute type thing. But great products, they don't give you the orange streakiness. I use them all the time. Um, very safe. Um, they're more of a tan instead of the orangey streaky stuff we used to have. So okay. they're, very, they're very cosmetically pleasing. All right. So if uh, we've been gardening for a long time, maybe all our life, and we start to worry about skin cancer, what are some things that uh, we can uh, take note of on our, on, our, on our skin? Any type of little red crusted areas or rough areas that are very small, on the, especially on the face and the hands, are probably gonna be your first signs of excessive sun damage. Um, they're considered precancerous lesions and can lead to squamous cells later on. But any type of a bump, lump, nodule, crusted area that's not healing, even though it's not giving you any pain, um, needs to be examined. Skin cancers are not usually painful or give you any discomfort, so people ignore them for too long. Skin cancer is very easy to treat in its early stages, um, but it, it's when people ignore them and let them get larger or invade a certain territory of the face that it becomes cosmetically disfiguring to treat them. So prevention and early detection are the key with sun cancer. Okay, so any little pink or reddish area mm -hmm. on our skin? Okay. If people are uh, of the age where they didn't grow up with sunscreen, Mm -hmm. um, they're at a disadvantage. Most of our sun damage is done by the time we're 18 or 20. Really? That's one of the biggest pushes for sunscreen in our kids. If we can prevent them, they think we can decrease the risk of skin cancer by 80%. That's quite a bit. That's incredible. I, yeah. I didn't know that. So the people that are unfortunate enough not to have grown up with sunscreen already have a lot of sun damage, especially here in Oklahoma where we kind of have a lot of agriculturally based um, professions. Um, they need to get in and get a baseline depending on their family history, depending on their skin type, and depending on the amount of sun exposure, um, the, they can give them a pretty good idea of when they need to come back, how often their follow-ups need to be. But again, cancer is something that in this field is so easy to treat that it's, 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 it's just too important to ignore. Sure. Okay. Well, I just want everybody to know that uh, whenever we do our program and I'm outside all the time, I don't have a hat on, but whenever I'm gardening, I always do wear my hat when I'm out in, in, the, uh, in the yard or in the garden. Well, Kenda, thank you very much. Thank I really you appreciate you coming. I appreciate and it. Telling us all about this. Happy to. Well, in addition to protecting our skin from the harmful rays of the sun, we also need to think about protecting our eyes when we're outside gardening. Today, we're here with David Cockrell from the Cockrell Eye Care Center. Hello, Dave. How are you? Welcome to the program. Glad to be here. Thank you. So Dave, what are some of the potential problems we could have if we don't wear eye protection when we're outside? Steve, there's a variety of problems that you can have at any time of the year unrelated to eye protection. In this case, in the springtime, when I see my patients starting to get out into the yard or get out into the garden, I talk to them about at least four different problems. I tell them in no particular order that they're likely to experience allergic conjunctivitis, which is due to the pollen and the grasses and the dust that are blowing. We'll talk more about that. I tell them about a problem called pinguecula, a problem called pterygium, which is the name for that is a southwestern eye disease. I also talk to them about ultraviolet protection and safety eyewear protection. And I'm going to go in no particular order, but we'll talk about pinguecula and pterygium first. Okay. You've seen in Oklahoma and Texas and Nebraska and, and California and Nevada, people with blue eyes like myself or brown eyes or any color, 
may have some little fleshy deposits that look a little yellowish or red sure. right up next to the cornea of the eye. Those are called pingueculas and pterygium. It's called a pinguecula when you just have that fleshy deposit right up next to the blue part of the eye. And you'll notice if you've been out and it's a windy day and there's a lots of sunshine, it gets a little red when you go indoors mm -hmm. and becomes slightly uncomfortable. Well, that can actually become advanced and start to grow onto the cornea later in life or 30s, 40s, it can start to grow onto the cornea. When it grows onto the cornea, we use a different name. We call it a pterygium, which is okay. a mouthful. Um, and that tissue actually continues to grow and it'll grow onto the cornea. People used to look at those pterygiums and think that's what a cataract was because they could see that growing onto the cornea. Okay. It's really not. Cataracts happen on the inside of the eye. Well, this pterygium will grow and grow and grow and finally advance over the cornea if it isn't surgically removed in some fashion. We know today that this problem is caused typically by environmental factors where we live. It's primarily a southwestern eye disease. Wind, dust, and UV light exposure are what causes it. We're a lot closer to the equator here than we are if we live in Alaska. Sure. And we're certainly a lot windier here and a lot dustier here than we are if we live in the northeastern United States or in the northwestern United States where it's cloudy and rainy most of the time. Okay, so is it more likely to be a problem here than the northern states? Significantly. You know, in, in, in this part of the country, you can look at virtually 100% of the people who are raised here, and by the time they're 45 to 50, they all have at least a pinguecula, that little fleshy deposit that they come in and ask about. And many will go ahead to develop pterygiums, especially our people who make their living in agriculture, people that are farmers, sure. people who work on the seacoast, develop it a lot more routinely. And okay. those are preventable or remediable problems. One of the ways we prevent that is with good eyewear that blocks out wind and dust, but most critically, it blocks out ultraviolet light. And we'll talk about eyewear in a few minutes, but if you can block, about, block out ultraviolet light, you can really slow down the rate of onset, slow down the rate of progression of those two problems. Okay, so if you get the uh, pterygium, Mm -hmm. and you want to have that removed from your eye, is, are there any problems there? Okay, that's a very good question. We tell our patients we want to do all we can to prevent having to get those removed. Often when you remove these pterygiums, you can activate the growth factors in that tissue. It can actually grow back much more rapidly. I have patients in my office that have had pterygiums removed multiple times it's in a very uncomfortable procedure to have done, especially when you realize you may need to have it done again very, very quickly. And each time that pterygium grows onto the cornea, the clear portion of your eye, it creates a little bit of scar tissue. So when you take it off, even though you've taken the pterygium off, you've still got the underlying scar tissue. So prevention is much, much better than resolution. It sure sounds problem. like it. Much better. Yeah. And the same for a pinguecula. Once again, prevention is much better than resolution as well. You know, here in Oklahoma, we're outside all the time, uh, or we hope to be at any rate, and so you're exposed to wind and dust and ultraviolet light every time you step out the door. We tell our patients to wear eyewear that protect against those three things, even if you don't need a prescription eyeglasses like I do, like yourself, if you're out here on a cloudy day, it's one thing. If you're out here in the bright sunshine all day long, you just have an increased exposure to the ultraviolet light. The other problem that we see a great deal of, and I saw a patient this morning with it, is allergic conjunctivitis. And uh, allergic conjunctivitis is exactly what it means. We hear the term conjunctivitis, many people think of the term eye infection. Well, itis just means inflammation. The conjunctiva is the clear membrane that covers the white part of her eye and the inside of her eyelid. When that turns red, you now have conjunctivitis. It could be infectious, it could be allergic, it could be chemical from splashing something in your eye. But when people first get out in the yard, get out in the garden, they kick up a lot of dust and a lot of dry grass, there's fresh pollen every place. Uh -huh. Just like you can have a stuffy nose or drainage in your throat, you can have allergic conjunctivitis around your eye and eyelid. So the same pollen that causes our nasal allergies can affect our eyes. That's exactly right. The same exact pollen. Here in Oklahoma, we're lucky enough to be able to have it year round. Yeah. Either, the, either the dust or the pollen or the something's ragweed pollinating, or something. ragweed in the yeah. fall. So it's not just strictly a springtime problem. But when you get in the garden, and you've been exposed to a great deal of the dust or the pollen or the grass, one of the simplest things to do about it is when you come indoors, it's literally to irrigate or rinse your eye with some saline or some eye drops, some of the over-counter eye drops to rinse it out. If you can get some of that particulate matter out, it's not gonna be up there to irritate your eye. Okay. And if it's really swollen, and it's really itchy, just a cold compress helps to shrink the swelling, helps to call, cool your eye off and stop some of the irritation. That's a good idea. And then certainly there's plenty of over-the-counter and prescription medications to help with that if it gets quite bad. I have a lot of people who garden, um, uh, really enjoy gardening a great sure. deal, 
And so they're in, that, in those environments a lot, but they still have allergic conjunctivitis. It's a treatable problem. Okay. Another big problem that I want to talk about is every single week in our office between the three docks there, we see at least one injury due to being outdoors, working in the yard. It's almost always off of a weed eater. Really? We do see them from a lawnmower, but weed eaters, if you think about it, that little device revolves around at several hundred revolutions per minute mm -hmm. to, to several thousand, actually. And when it picks up a piece of debris on the ground, whether it's a rock or a a piece of wood or a flake of metal that was laying there. You know, you think about the, the beatings that your legs take when it kicks it off. Well, sure. if one of those comes up and hits your eye, I saw a patient with one of those injuries yesterday, it can cause any place from minor to very, very severe lacerations of the cornea or of the eyelid. We strongly encourage every one of your viewers, all of our patients, to wear protective eyewear. And protective eyewear can run the gamut of goggles that you put on for complete protection to safety glasses that you put on. They're now inexpensive. You can buy them at the local hardware. You can buy them many places for 9 or 10 or $11 and put them on. And I have so many patients who tell me, gosh, I didn't want to wear them because I got they make my face too hot, but right. as soon as you have one of those injuries, you don't get hot at all when you put them on. Absolutely, Dave. I know there have been times when I've been out weed eating and uh, I've hit a little rock or something and it glances off my, my sunglasses or my safety glasses. I sure am glad I had them on at that time. Yeah, they're, they're very, very critical. The other place that wearing eyewear outdoors uh, comes, into, uh, comes into account or is very important is when we talk about ultraviolet light, we know that ultraviolet light, as I said, hastens the uh, progression of the course of the pinguecula and of the pterygium. Also, there's a term cataract that we've all heard about. We sure. all know someone who's had cataracts at some point in time. We know that UV light, UVA, UVB, hastens the progression of those cataracts. So if you're wearing eyewear that has an ultraviolet blocker in it, you're gonna s eliminate the eyewear, the ultraviolet light that gets to your inside of your eye where the lens is on the inside of your eye. That can be sunglasses. It can be clear lenses like mine that have an ultraviolet blocker to block UV light out. Okay. So UV light, remember, is the non-visible spectrum. It's below the visible spectrum, below 340 nanometers for certain, typically below 320 nanometers of light. So okay. you can do that with sunglasses or conventional glasses. All right. So Dave, do you have some examples of sunglasses? I brought along a couple of different things. Sunglasses run the gamut of lenses that are just dark like this that have an ultraviolet blocker. And you've got a pair there that I want to talk about as well. And then also for those people who don't want to have to keep up with a second pair of sunglasses, now almost eyewear have these wonderful clips that will just either clip over it or these magnetic clips. So you don't have to worry about scratching your lenses up. But these clips also have ultraviolet blockers in them. So you can block out the UV light just as effectively. One place where Steve's uh, sunglasses are better. If you put those on, they're going to block out wind from the side as well as light from the side. They're going to block it out pretty well from the top, so you've got almost complete protection with that eyewear from ultraviolet light and from wind and dust, which is really, really critical. Think about when it's a dusty day, you've been out here working, you take those off, you've got that ring all Absolutely. the way around. Think about how much debris you blocked out of your eye. You can do the same thing with these and these, but the larger the lens and the more it wraps around to protect your eye, the better off you are. Okay. Well, Dave, not only can we protect our eyes when we're out here gardening, but uh, we can also look cool when we're pulling those weeds. That's exactly right. You can indeed.